بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين Brothers and sisters in Islam السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته once again and welcome to this series which we have called the end series what I want to talk to you about today is answering the question who are the people of paradise we touched a little bit on it last week and today we'll continue it who are the people of paradise who are they what are their qualities and are there any of these people who have been named by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam or indicated to by him in specific that will be among the people of paradise? If so, why was it them? So alhamdulillah who has guided us to this wonderful religion and we ask Allah to place us in Jannah and to save us from hellfire. My brothers and sisters in Islam, every human being must have a goal. And there is something called wishful thinking. A believer does not believe in something called wishful thinking. What I mean by that is, if you want to attain something, then you set your goal and you make it realistic and you, and you understand what its requirements are and then you work for it. Wishful thinking is basically making up some unrealistic wishes in our heads and then we hope to reach them when there's no such thing. Or we want to reach something, but we don't do anything about it except for wish for it. And then we assume just by wishing for something that we're going to get it. This doesn't exist in Islam. Al Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in the authentic hadith, Laysa al imanu bittamanni. Belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, true connection to Allah, is not by mere wishful thinking. Just because you say, I believe in paradise, for example, and I want to go there. This person thinks that by saying that, that's all that it needs. This is very wrong. And this person is really in danger. They must be taught and has, you know, rethink rationally. Jannah is not acquired through thus wishful intentions. Rather, it has to be accompanied with action and hard work. Al Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, أَلَا إِنَّ سِلْعَةَ اللَّهِ غَالِيَةَ أَلَا إِنَّ سِلْعَةَ اللَّهِ هِيَ الْجَنَّةِ Behold everyone. أَلَا أَلَا in Arabic doesn't really have a particular meaning but it's a form they used to use to capture the attention of people when they're about to say something important. أَلَا Behold the product of Allah, the merchandise which Allah has created to give away is very expensive. Behold, again, Rasul Sallam captures the attention of the people once more. And he says, the merchandise, the product of Allah which he has to give away is Al-Jannah. That is the ultimate reward, the ultimate product which Allah has in store for people who work for it. And then the Prophet Sallam advised to work and strive for it. Allah said in the Quran, إِنَّكَ كَادِحٌ إِلَىٰ رَبِّكَ كَدَحًا فَمُلَاقِيهِ you, O Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you shall strive in great effort in this life until you reach your Lord. It is as though Allah is telling us that this world, the life here, on it has been sealed hard work. You cannot ever say to yourself, don't ever think that we can reach paradise without hard work, without struggle. And we're not going to be tested in some way or another. Tested as in, we ourselves need to earn paradise. And therefore we need to cross these obstacles. To earn it through our growth. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Did you think or assume or wish to enter paradise? And when the examples of those who came before you come to you in how they worked for it, you find yourself not ready to do the same or even come close. Allah mentions this in the Quran. Allah gives us examples of people before and how they worked for paradise and how they struggled towards it. Al Rasul Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his feet cracked open and they seeped with pus 
praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the middle of the night, more than anyone can do, just to say, thank you Allah for what you had given me. Allah had given him forgiveness for all any sins or mistakes which he would ever do. Although Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam doesn't sin. So we have to work for Jannah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala most high says in the Quran, this ayah, which I'm about to, well, this is what it says, to each is a goal to which Allah turns him. Then strive together, as in a race, towards all that is good. In Surah Al-Baqarah. This ayah came down in relation to when the qibla was changed. However, what, however, the other meaning of this verse, the general meaning of it is, every human, every person has a goal they want to reach. And Allah has provided us with the goal that we need to reach. So Allah says, since everyone has a goal of their own, I am turning your goal towards me. And that's why the Qibla was changed. You want to follow, the Qibla was changed from Al-Aqsa to Mecca, to the Kaaba. Change. The essence of that change, one of the essence of that change is, will you follow, will you follow the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Is that your goal? Everyone else has a goal. What's your goal? And here is something for you to test yourself with, to see which goal you're going to follow. Will you follow my Qibla or the Qibla of someone else? So Allah says, race each other to that goal then. So now that you know your goal is Jannah, is Allah, the meeting of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in paradise, then strive, Allah says, and race each other. Allah says in Surah Al-Munafiqoon, after he describes Jannah, after he describes what, what we have in there, then he says, وَفِي ذَلِكَ فَلْيَتَنَافَسِ الْمُتَنَافِسُونَ For this, those who want to compete should compete for. This is the true competition. You want to compete? This is the ultimate competition. Compete for Jannah. Compete for Jannah. Allah is ordering us to do that. He is guiding us towards that. Allah says, وَسَابِقُوا وَسَابِقُوا إِلَىٰ مَغْفِرَةٍ مِّن رَبِّكُمْ وَجَنَّةٍ And race each other to a forgiveness from your Lord and to a paradise. Allah put forgiveness first and then paradise. As though Allah is telling us, I know you will all sin. I know you will make mistakes. Don't despair. The first thing you have to do and be quick about it is seek Allah's forgiveness sincerely from your heart. And make amendments with Allah. Renew your connection with Him all the time. Till death, no matter how many times you sin. The idea is not that you're perfect. The idea is when you do sin, grow. Ask forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Learn from it, try not to do it again. And grow in your character so that you may be of those who earn paradise. As though the people of paradise are of a particular characteristic. And that characteristic cannot be attained unless you actually learn from your mistakes in life and rise and become one of those. Then Allah says, Wajannah, and then paradise. So repentance drags us to paradise. Once the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam after speaking about the descriptions of paradise, he concluded with the following statement. He said, We said this last week. In paradise, there will be bounties which the eye has never seen. The ear has not ever heard. No human heart has ever perceived before. Then he said, read if you wish from the Holy Qur'an, from the Noble Qur'an. Which means, they forsake their beds, calling upon their Lord in fear and in hope, and spend out of what we have given them. So no soul knows what refreshment of the eye is hidden for them, a reward for what they did. A reward for what they did. Just to explain this verse a little bit. Now, the first part of it, they forsake their beds. Allah is referring here to, first of all, Rasul speaks about paradise, then he recites this verse. 
He wants to recite this verse in order to tell us that in this verse is the ingredient of how you can reach what no eye has ever seen, no, heart, no ear has ever heard, and no heart has ever perceived. So he says, they forsake their beds. In this ayah, it came down in relation to the companions of the Prophet wasallam that they used to stay up a lot in the night praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and so they didn't sleep much in the night. تَتَجَافَ جُنُوبُ عَنِ الْمَضَاجِعِ Literally means their sides barely hit the beds. As though he is saying they hardly sleep. They're worshipping Allah in the night. They supplicate to him, calling upon their Lord in fear, afraid of his hellfire. So they're calling upon their Lord to save them from hellfire. وَطَمَعَ and in greed or in hope. In greed. Literally it's greed. You can also say hope. Greed for paradise. So as though the Prophet is telling us, you want Jannah? Work for it. And supplicate to Allah in fear and in hope. Supplicate to him you're afraid of, par- Jannah, of hellfire. Express this to him subhanahu wa ta'ala. And express to him subhanahu wa ta'ala that you are greedy for what he has prepared for you. And my Lord, I fear your hellfire. I seek refuge in you from you. And I beseech you in hope in you. And I want your paradise. Give it to me. And then he said, So no soul knows what refreshment of the eye is hidden for them, a reward for what they did. Depending on how much we work, depending on how much we do, Allah hides away gifts and presents and secret surprises in Jannah. All as a result of our actions. Brothers and sisters in Islam, imagine, obviously Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi told us every person has a place in heaven and every person that's born also has a place in hellfire. And then you secure the one that you deserve by your actions in this life. Your actions earn Allah's generosity as we said last week. They earn Allah's mercy. Our actions are not even worthy of paradise but they earn Allah's generosity and mercy and so He gives us out of His generosity. Do you want to build that paradise of yours? You've got gardens. You want to build in them houses. You want to build in them trees. You want to build in them uh, all the beautiful of whatever Allah has created in them. You build it. How do you build it? Not with money. See, if you buy a land in this life, a land, you go down to Greenvale and there's some, some lands over there, you know, next suburb over here for sale. You go down towards Craigieburn and after that there's some land for sale. You buy that land and then what? You can either invest it and resell it, but in Jannah, you can't resell it. In Jannah, you don't want to sell it. It is the ultimate goal. Now you want to fill that land with something on it. You want to fill it with, what do you want to fill it with? Fill it up with the, whatever Allah has given you. And the way you fill it with your palaces and trees and, and so on and so forth is with the actions that we do in this life. For example, for example, Rasul Sallallahu tells us that whoever prays the 12 sunnahs of the day, the 12 sunnahs that we know, ratiba in the day, will have a palace built for them in paradise. In another hadith, anyone who is in an argument because of worldly reasons or even because of religious reasons, but there, it's an argument about who's, who's going to know more, who's going to beat the other in the argument, not for the sake of Allah. Whoever leaves the argument for the sake of Allah, he'll have a house built for them in the middle of paradise. What does it mean, leaves it? Meaning, you know that this argument is going to lead to fight and quarrel and swearing. Even though you're in the right, turn away and just leave it. Walk away. You'll have a house built for you in the middle of Jannah. So there are many different actions that a person can do in this life. Read in a hadith and you'll see. And build your paradise. Build your trees. Plant your gardens. And you watch what you will have. So Allah says, فَمَا تَدْرِي نَفْسٌ مَا أُخْفِيَ لَهُمْ مِنْ قُرَّةِ أَعْيُنْ No one knows of what bounties that refresh the eyes are hidden for them. جَزَاءً بِمَا كَانُوا يَعْمَلُونَ this, What he has hidden for them is the reward of what they used to do. So the amount of actions, the types of actions, you get rewards in, in return. These are the people of paradise. This is not one description. Another description. Allah says, وَالَّذِينَ جَاهَدُوا فِينَا لَنَهْدِيَنَّهُمْ سُبُلَنَا and those who strive in our cause will certainly be guide, we will certainly guide them to our paths. For indeed, Allah is with those who do right. In Allah ma'al muhsinin. So, people strive for many things. People strive for wealth. 
People strive to buy a company, to become a CEO of a company, right? To build their business and become millionaires. People strive to buy islands, buildings, have ownership of large countries and, and, and refineries or factories. People strive to buy a, a, the car of their dreams. People strive to find the wife that they've always dreamed of or the husband they've always wanted. People strive and strive for glory, for fame, for status. People strive for different things. People strive for, to, to show off. People strive to whatever they strive for. إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَةِ All actions are judged by your intentions. But then there are people who strive in their wealth. So they give up that wealth that other people strive for. They strive in their bodies so people, for what people strive for. For the selfishness, they give it up. People strive with whatever Allah has given them of property, which other people would have strived to get. They strive by giving it up in the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yourself, your body. So it goes through struggle, pain, blood, even sometimes, if need be. In the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ask us to do in His path? It's all acts of righteousness. So Allah says, a reward for those who do right. Not those who do wrong. You shed your bl there are people who shed their blood in the, name, in the name of glory. To have statues built, monuments built out of them. Ancient Romans, they used to fight to have statues built to that, for them. That was their goal in life. Others, they fight and they get killed for, you know, as we said, to have glory or fame and so on and so forth. People to live their name after them, to, be, to have cities or countries named after them. This is what they will receive. There are people who will put their life at risk for money, even by doing illegal things, both Islamically and secularly. So drugs, for example, they will put their life on the line. There will people who imitate certain other thugs who want this particular glory. And so they tattoo on themselves things like live by the gun and die by the gun. They strive by the gun. Those who strive in the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are the ones who deserve the greatest reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. My brothers and sisters in Islam, paradise therefore demands hard work. It is for the hard-working people who work for it. The harder you work, the higher you will rise. And the Prophet ﷺ told us, when you ask Allah salu, saluhu al-firdaus, asking for al-firdaus, the highest place in Jannah, don't just settle for the lowest. Some people say, to be an underdog in paradise is all I want. To, to just barely make it to paradise, if I have to drag myself and crawl, to get to paradise, that's good enough for me. No, that's not good enough for you. You've placed yourself on the edge of things. A person who placed themselves on the edge of things are more likely to fall into the haram and fall into Jahannam. Make your aim very high because you'll either reach it or somewhere close to it, inshallah. And hadith of the Prophet, ﷺ, which is in Bukhari, that the Prophet ﷺ said, وَحُفَّةِ النَّارُ بِالشَّهَوَاتِ Hellfire has been veiled with desires and paradise has been veiled surrounded by hardships. I'll repeat that. Paradise has been surrounded by hardships and hellfire has been surrounded by desires. Whichever one you can cross, you'll reach whatever is behind it. So if you can penetrate through the desires, you'll reach hellfire. And if you can penetrate through the wall of hardships, you'll reach Jannah. Which one do you want? There are difficulties around health, uh, paradise. But these difficulties are easy upon the believer who loves Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and strives for it, who loves Allah and wants to meet Him. Types of these difficulties are hardships in life, sufferings that you'll be tested with. And secondly, there are things which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered us to do, such as the five daily prayers, fasting, charity, gift from, from oneself, sacrifice in order for good. These things, the nafs, the self, every human being naturally finds discomfort in doing, giving away your money, you know, working hard when you can just rest, praying five times a day, waking up for fajr, fasting, abstaining from food and drink from sunrise to sunset. These are things which the nafs naturally dislikes. Ongoing actions of this. And your nafs, you're at constant wrestling with it. You're wrestling your nafs. 
And the companions of the Prophet ﷺ used to make poetry about their nafs. Ya nafsu tubi, O nafs, talking to this desire inside of them that was always urging them to the wrong, to selfishness. Ya nafsu tubi, O nafs, repent. O nafs, repent. O nafs, what are you doing to yourself? They used to talk to their nafs with their good conscience. O nafs, don't steal. O nafs, don't make zina. O nafs, don't go do the haram for you cannot bear the fire. And so on and so forth. So paradise has been covered with the hardships. If you are able to pass these hardships and do them to the best of your ability, then you will be rewarded with Jannah. But those who follow their desires and obey them, Fajr time comes and your nafs tells you, what are you getting up for, man? Give your body a rest. Sleep. The pillow is nice. So they sleep. Obey their nafs. What's this five daily prayers? I'm a good person. I don't need to pray five daily prayers. So the nafs tells them, just do something else. The nafs keeps telling you and telling Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells you in the Quran about the wife of Al-Aziz in the time of Yusuf alayhi salam. وَمَا أُبَرِّئُ نَفْسِي She says, my nafs is not innocent. إِنَّ النَّفْسَ لَأَمَّارَةٌ بِالسُّوءِ إِلَّا مَنْ رَحِمٌ She said, the nafs is surely something your desires always tell you to do wrong things except whom Allah has saved from that. So this nafs is what will call you to hellfire. Obeying its desires, being selfish, being self-centered. You're at a wrestling match. And we can choose this world by obeying our desires and this will become your paradise and it will end. Or you choose the hereafter which is an eternal paradise. Allah is generous. Which one do you want? It's your choice. So paradise is very high. The greatest blessing of Allah. It requires much exertion. The way to paradise is filled with things to go against human wishes and inclinations. This needs strong determination and willpower. And one of the best ways of entering Jannah is for the steadfast, al-mustaqimun. Allah teaches us to recite al-Fatiha in every prayer. And what do we say in it? Ihdina sirat al-mustaqim. Oh Allah, guide us to the steadfast path, the path that is all the way. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Inna al-ladhina amanu thumma istaqamu. تَتَنَزَّلُ عَلَيْهِمُ الْمَلَائِكَةُ أَلَّا تَخَافُوا وَلَا تَحْزَنُوا وَأَبْشِرُوا بِالْجَنَّةِ الَّتِي وَعِدَ الْمُتَّقُونَ Those who believe in Allah. And then after they believed, they are steadfast. They continue all the way on what they believed in. The angels descend upon them and they say to them, Do not fear and you will have no sadness. This is on the Day of Judgment. And be ye have glad tidings that you will receive paradise. So these are another people of paradise. Al-istiqamah, consistency on the straight path, is the ultimate challenge of reaching the highest places of paradise. Not just for a year or two, and then you give up and go backwards, but until your death. And I would like to repeat a reminder. There was a few examples of this man who I think was Imam al-Shanqiti rahmatullahi alayhi who used to say I think it was him if I'm not wrong he said I ask Allah for his mercy on his deathbed 40 years of my life 40 years of my life I did not miss out on a single prayer in jama'ah behind the imam in the masjid Except that I was there before the Imam said Allahu Akbar in the first rakah. I was there for 40 years. He says, and 20 of those years I was in the masjid before the Mu'addin said Allahu Akbar. Istiqama. These are people that, you know, we put up there as our goal to reach. You try. These are the highest ones. You can reach somewhere halfway there, inshallah, that's good. Another man at the time, the companion sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he used to pray every salat in jama'ah in the masjid. And one day a visitor came to him. Or is it one of the tabi'een? Visitor came to him for Aisha. And he passed Aisha. They prayed at home. He said, that night I saw in my dreams that the people of, that pray with me in the masjid, they were on horses. And they were galloping a long way in front of me. And I tried to catch up with a fast horse. But each time I came really close, they'd beat me again. And I managed to reach one of them in the end rows. And I said to him, why can't I reach you? And he said, you will not be able to tonight. I said, why? He said, because you, could, because you did not reach us in jama'ah tonight. 
So obviously that night they had taken a footstep ahead or a few gallops ahead. So we are in a race. We always have to return and have this consistency, inshallah, as much as we can. And I recall Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal on his deathbed when he would say, La ba'ad, la ba'ad, not yet, not yet. He wasn't saying, I don't want to die yet, I don't want to die yet. When he became conscious, he said to his son, Not yet, not yet. The shaitan came to me saying, You have escaped me, Ya Ahmad. You know, I couldn't beat you. And he's trying to trick me. So I can let my guards down and say, Yes, I've won. But, I, but he wanted to trick me when I let my guards down. So I said to him, The fight between you and me is not over yet. I'm still waiting. Until my soul gets out of my body, the fight between you and me will be over. So consistency all the way. Um, how many people will enter paradise? That's a good question. How many people will enter Jannah? The answer is, it's going to shock you, but then I'll give you the other side of it. Out of every 1,000 people, only one will enter paradise. Out of every 1,000 people, only one will enter paradise. In Sahih al-Bukhari, it is narrated that the Prophet wasallam said, The first man to be called on the day of resurrection will be Adam alayhi salam, who will be shown his offspring, and it will be said to him, and it will be said to the ummah, to the people, هَذَا أَبُوكُمْ Adam." This is your father, Adam. And Adam will say, responding to the call, لَبَّيْكَ وَسَعَدَيْكَ يَا رَبِّي I hear I come, my Lord, whatever you will, I am here. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say to Adam alayhi salam, take out of your offspring, out of your children, the people of hellfire. And then Adam, and then Adam alayhi salam will say, O oh Lord, how many should I take out? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say, take out 99 out of every hundred. 99 out of every hundred. And then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they said to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, O Messenger of Allah, if 99 out of every 100 of us are taken away, what will remain out of us? He said, my followers in comparison to the other nations are like a white hair on a black ox. So this one out of 100 actually will enter paradise. And they said, Ya Rasulullah, how many of us will be left? He said, my followers in comparison to other nations are like a white hair on a black ox. What is this telling us? It's, good, it's glad tidings actually. Our Rasul Sallallahu is talking about the ummah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, us inshaAllah. The nation of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And these followers of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam will be so small in amount on that day that the majority of the people of the world from the beginning of Adam till the end of time from the beginning of Adam alayhi salam till the end of time the majority of them have disbelieved Allah says in the Quran وَإِن تطع أكثر من في الأرض يضلوك عن سبيل الله. If you were to follow the majority of the people on earth they will lead you astray Allah usually praises in the Qur'an al-aqallun, the small amounts. Usually small amounts follow Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you'll find this in many of the nations of the Prophets. you find this in the people of Nuh alayhi salam. They say in the hadith that only 80 people followed Nuh alayhi salam. And the majority didn't believe. And Allah constantly says about most of the Prophets, وَمَا آمَنَ مَعَهُ إِلَّا قَلِيلٌ And no one believed in him except very small amounts, small amounts, small amounts. So this large amount that will enter hellfire, the ummah of the Prophet ﷺ makes up like the white hair on a black ox. The ummah of the Prophet ﷺ. So having said this, who will enter paradise first? Is my question. The first one to reach paradise and to open its gates will be the messenger of Allah, Muhammad ﷺ. In Sahih Muslim, it is collected that the Prophet ﷺ said, or that he will come to the gates of paradise and ask for it to be opened. And the gatekeeper will ask, Man anta? Who are you? And the Prophet ﷺ will say, Ana Muhammad. 
I am Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The gatekeeper will say, I was ordered not to open the gate for anyone else before you. Umirtu alla aftah al-bab li ahadin qablak. The ummah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam will enter before others. We ask Allah to make us one of them. Then the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, We are the last of the nations in this world, but we will be the first on the day of resurrection to enter paradise. We will be the first of mankind to enter paradise. This is narrated in Bukhari. The first man to enter paradise after the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam is Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. The first woman to enter paradise will be Fatima al Zahra radiallahu anha, the daughter of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, according to the authentic hadiths. The first youth to enter paradise, the first youths who will enter paradise and they died as youths, will be the grandsons of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, al Hasan and al Hussein radiallahu anhu. And the first martyr to enter paradise will be Hamza radiallahu anhu. In general, brothers and sisters, in general, the poor people will enter paradise 40 years ahead of the rich people. Hmm. What does that mean? This is in Sahih Muslim. And 40 years here is not the same as our 40 years here. It's different. The poor will enter before the rich. The Prophet ﷺ said, the poor of the muhajireen, the migrants at the time of the Prophet ﷺ, will enter paradise 500 years ahead of the rich of the muhajireen. Because, he said, the poor will not have to give the accountability of their property. On the day of judgment, you're going to be accountable for what you have, right? You will be asked about your property. Did you earn it from halal? Did you give from its zakat? Did you give from what it earned? Did you provide for your family? Did you look after it as Allah looked after it? Did you steal? Did you, how did you acquire it and how did you spend it? All has to be accountable for. And the poor entering paradise before you doesn't mean that they will reach higher places than the rich. The hadith, wallahu alam, does not indicate that. What it is indicating is that a poor person will not have much to account for. What property did he or she have? So they'll be entering. And this is also a virtue for the poor. The poor person, when they say, you know, in this life, Allah is teaching us, if you're poor and you haven't got provision as much as the rich people, don't be saddened. Everyone will have something in return. So if you were poor and you didn't get to enjoy life as much as the rich, then don't worry. You'll enter paradise before them by a long time because you don't have much to be accounted for. As for the rich people, they may enter higher places, yes, but they have a long way to go before they have to account for every piece of their wealth. Did they donate from it properly? Did they earn it properly? Did they spend it properly? And here is one of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ, which I'm about to mention as one of the ten who were promised paradise. His name is Abdul Rahman ibn Auf. This man was among the richest of the companions of the Prophet. ﷺ. And as I said, he was one of the ten who were promised paradise by the Prophet ﷺ specifically. One day after the death of the Prophet ﷺ, one day Aisha radiallahu anha reported that one day he came, entered the Medina, and he had about a hundred camels worth of merchandise. And everybody gathered. She said, I saw everybody gathering. That's a large amount of wealth in those days. Large amount of wealth. Everybody's gathering to buy and to trade and... And then she reported, she said, I heard the Prophet ﷺ say that Abdul Rahman ibn Auf عنه, will enter paradise. However, he will enter at Habwan. Habwan, meaning crawling. When the news reached Abdul Rahman ibn Auf, عنه, she said, because of his wealth, he will have to account for it and then he'll have to answer for it and something has happened and because of his wealth, he will have to enter it somehow crawling with Allah's justice. This is what he will deserve. So then he said, Ya Aisha, I make you bear witness that I have donated all of these fi sabilillah. I donate them all in the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just so that I will not enter paradise crawling. And so Abdul Rahman ibn Auf earned entering paradise not crawling. This does not mean he will not enter paradise. This does not mean that he will be tortured. But it will delay him for some reason which only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows and is justified. And it's not telling us to know how to be rich. 
Allah says in the Quran, قُلْ مَنْ حَرَّمَ زِينَةَ اللَّهِ لِعِبَادِهِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ Why did, who ever said that Allah has forbidden richness and luxuries for his believing servants? Allah did not forbid this for us. However, something about the wealth of Abdurrahman ibn Auf later on will cause him to enter crawling. Allah knows best how. The companions of the Prophet ﷺ, wealth was not a big deal to them. So they lived on what they had. Wealth meant donating it. Wealth meant helping others. Wealth meant like that. They did not get jealous of wealth. They did not. And maybe for some people, wealth will deter you from earning greater rewards. Maybe Abdurrahman ibn Auf's wealth, because of the amount of it, he had, it had to busy him so much that he would have done so many other good deeds in that time. But that time was taken up because he had so much business to take care of. So a Muslim should try their best to plan their life around their worship, not their earnings around their life, as much as they can. And if they have business, then they should turn their business into some type of worship. If you have a business, you can turn it into some form of da'wah. If you have a business and you earn some wealth from it, try to maintain a lot, you know, an amount from it fi sabilillah. Try to make it halal. Try to earn it in halal. Try to donate it in halal. Try, so try to turn anything you have into what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves you to do with it. And this is Abdul Rahman ibn Auf. He's doing some things with, with his wealth. He's benefiting others for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet wasallam said, also said, I was shown the first three people to enter paradise. And he said, the first three will be the shaheed, the martyr. He said, then the one who is chaste and proud, you are chaste, meaning you prevent your sexual desires from haram. And muta'affif, you are also proud in the sense, not in a negative way. Meaning you don't go and ask people for things. Rather you are a person who gives. And you may be in need, but you leave it as the last resort. Allah says in the Quran, لا يسألون الناس الحافة. This is another virtue. They're not the types of people, like they could be the people of paradise, but not the ones of example who will enter first. The ones who will enter first are not those who go around asking others for things, but rather they are the ones who give others things. Even at the times of their need, they try their best to avoid. They try their best not to complain, in other words. You know, I haven't got money to spend. I can't this, I can't that. Times of donations come. They complain about how, you know, they're not doing so well. Even if a person's not doing so well, they should not complain about that to people. They should complain it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and try their best. If you do say so, you'll be in higher ranks in paradise, you'll be among the first to enter. Afifu muta'affif. You're probably in need, but you don't make it prevalent in front of people. So you look like you're not in need, but you may be in need. And these are the best types of people actually. And he said, and the third one is, the slave who worships Allah, slave of Allah, yani, the slave or the servant who worships Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with devotion and is faithful and sincere towards his master, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So sincerity, devotion, faithful when you worship, not just to show it off, not just mechanical, whatever. You mean it. You come and you pray because you want Allah, you want Allah to see your work, and you pray to the best of your ability as much as you can. Now, my brothers and sisters in Islam, there are certain types of people who will enter paradise. They are called, or they are the 70,000 in number. Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This hadith came in Muslim and Bukhari and by Imam Ahmad, Sahih al Jama' al Sagheer, and so on. That the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam once came out to us, the companion Ibn Abbas says, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa came out to us and said, some nations were displayed before me. Allah showed some nations displayed before the Prophet ﷺ. And then he said, A prophet would pass in front of me with one man. Meaning on the day of judgment, I saw prophets coming past and only one man has followed them. The prophets called to Allah and from their people only one man would have believed in him. In other words, brothers and sisters, don't despair in your da'wah. If you call people or you try to invite to Islam and you find that the majority are not listening, at least one person, then don't feel bad because even the prophets, some prophets will even have affected only one man. Imagine their eloquence and their best way of speech. It's the people's choice. And another prophet with only two men. And another with a group of people. And another with nobody even with him. Some prophets wouldn't even have been able to influence even one. 
Then I saw a great crowd covering the horizon. And I wished that they were my followers, the Prophet ﷺ said. But it was said to me, this is Moses, alayhi salam, Musa and his followers. So Musa Asam had a great people, children of Israel, who followed him, will enter paradise with him. Then it was said to me, look. And I looked and saw a big gathering with a large number of people covering the horizon. With a large number of people covering the horizon, even bigger than the other one. Then it was said to me, these are your followers. And among them, there are 70,000 who will enter paradise without being asked about their accounts. Then the people dispersed. And the Prophet ﷺ did not tell who these 70,000 people were. So the companions of the Prophet ﷺ started talking about it. And some started to guess who they were. Then the Prophet ﷺ called them back and he said, These 70,000 people are the people who do not draw an evil omen from birds. You know, they, don't draw, they don't believe in superstitions. And do not get treated by branding. This is a type of medicine they used to use which involved... Also superstitious beliefs. And they truly put their trust only in their Lord. al kawi no. al kay This is not a proper medicine. They used to put their trust in things that they weren't sure of and just say, I'll just believe in it. I'll just put my blind faith in it. So basically putting blind faith into things other than Allah. Then Ukasha radiallahu anhu got up. And he said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, am I one of those 70,000? And the Prophet ﷺ said, Yes. Then another person got up and he said, Am I one of them, O oh, Rasulullah? The Prophet ﷺ said, Sabakaka ilayha ukasha. Ukasha beat you to it. In here we find that there is something of true trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. People who complain their worries and their complaints to other people may not be under this 70,000. They may enter paradise, they may be among higher places, but they're not among the 70,000. Those who resort to medicine, yes, but their trust is solely to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they use the medicine which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created, and we know that it can benefit, yes. But the people who complain their sicknesses, their worries, their lack of whatever in life, their poverty, their, 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 to people may not be under those 70,000. Allah knows best. So full trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, complain only to Allah and seek your medicine and your help in the proper means but without trying to complain to other people, either that, either that as the last resort. And do not believe, obviously, in superstitious acts. They used to fly birds. If one of them wants to go on a journey, they'd put a bird. And if it flew to the right, for example, they'd say, this is a good omen, so we should go. And if it flew to the left, they'd go, oh, this is a bad omen, we should not go. This is superstitious beliefs. Today we have many of these superstitious beliefs. Just, you know, in the magazines, star signs, tarot readings, and so on and so forth. A Muslim doesn't put their trust in omens. So, 70,000 without accountability will be them. Now, my brothers and sisters in Islam, among those who are promised paradise collectively and not in name in specific as a whole, they are described in the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, among the first, He said, And the first to embrace Islam of the Muhajirun and the Ansar, and also those who followed them exactly in faith, Allah is well pleased with them as they are well pleased with Him. He has prepared for them gardens under which rivers flow to dwell therein forever. That is the supreme success. Surah at tawbah The Muhajirun and the Ansar. The Muhajirun are the ones who first migrated with the Prophet ﷺ. And the Ansar, they are the ones who met the Prophet ﷺ in Medina. And then those who followed them afterwards, even till today, in perfect faith, Use them as an example and try to be like them. Perfect faith. They are also collectively included in the promise of paradise by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there are several other descriptions in the Quran we mentioned last week about those who are collectively described as the people of paradise. We can be any one of them insha'Allah. But now I would like to give you an example of what they call the ten promised paradise. But before I say it, when we say ten, it's not really only the ten. They used this heading, Rasul did not say the ten promised paradise, but it was a heading used afterwards because the Prophet mentioned these ten in one statement. But the Prophet also in other occasions mentioned other companions as well and added them on top. So don't take the heading as a specific definition of only those ten. 
You will find other hadiths in other places, the Prophet ﷺ mentioning others as people of paradise, including females, women, who are not mentioned in this particular hadith. But I'll start with this hadith, and, the Prophet, and then I'll tell you the other occasions the Prophet ﷺ mentioned others. Because, you know, there are many hadiths the Prophet ﷺ would mention something collectively in one go, then another time mention something else, and you think, hold on, but I heard this here. Why is this added? There's no contradiction. It's just that Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi mentioned him in different occasions. But we put them under headings and we think this is it. So it's not only the ten, but they, these ten were mentioned in one go. Narrated by Sa'id ibn Zayd, this hadith is Abu, Abu Dawood and it's Sahih according to Shaykh Al Albani rahmatullahi alayhi in, in Al Jama' al Sahih. Narrated by Sa'id ibn Zayd, and there are similar hadiths like this in Sahih Muslim, by the way, that Abdul Rahman, Abdul Rahman ibn al Akhnas said that when he was in the masjid, a man abused Ali radiallahu anhu. This was after the death of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Some man got up and he abused Ali radiallahu anhu. So Sa'id ibn Zayd got up and he said, "I bear witness to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam that I heard him say, 10 persons will go to paradise in this particular occasion." And then he counted, "Abu Bakr fil Jannah." Abu Bakr will, be, will go to paradise. Umar fil Jannah. Umar will go to paradise. Uthman fil Jannah. Uthman radiallahu anhu will go to paradise. Ali fil Jannah. Ali radiallahu anhu will go to paradise. Talha fil Jannah. Talha will go to paradise. Zubayr ibn al-Awam fil Jannah. He will also be in paradise. Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas fil Jannah. Or wa Sa'dun fil Jannah. He is also in paradise. Wa Abdul Rahman ibn Awf fil Jannah. He is also in paradise. Abu Ubaid ibn al-Jarrah fil Jannah. And then Sa'id ibn Zayd, he stopped right there at the ninth. And if he said, if I wish, I can mention the tenth. But he, re he re resorted. Why? Then the people asked, who is he? Ya Sa'id. So he kept silent. He was thinking, should I say it? And you'll know why. They again asked and they insisted, who is he? And then finally he replied, he is Sa'id ibn Zayd himself. Yeah. He then said, the company of one man whose face has been covered with dust by the messenger of Allah وسلم, is better than the actions of one of you for a whole lifetime, even if he is granted the lifespan of Nuh alayhi salam. And anyone who was with the messenger وسلم, fighting with him on the battlefields and the dust of the horse's legs and the feet of the soldiers and the swords were to hit the faces of the people who were accompanying the Prophet ﷺ, our actions, even if we live the life of Nuh السلام, of good actions will not equal there. Will not equal that stance with him ﷺ. Why? Not because they happened to be there. It is because of what made them strive towards us. Something inside their hearts which made their iman even stronger than us. Not all the companions had this, but these ten, all of them, all of them had this privilege included in the first battle called the Battle of Badr. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi used to say, O oh, the people of Badr, those who fought in Badr, اعملوا ما شئتم. Do whatever you please after today, for no sin will harm you. No sin will ever harm you after this day. Obviously they didn't do that. Instead, Allah says that their iman increased. وَجِلَتْ قُلُوبُهُمْ زَادَتْهُمْ إِيمَانًا Their hearts begin to tremble and their iman began to increase. It only increased them in iman. You see, a bad person, when you give them something like that, say, do whatever you wish now, no sin will ever harm you. They'll go and do as many sins as they can. But a person who Allah knows is very special and virtuous, if you say to them, do as many sins as you like, what will they do? They say, oh my God, what a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now we love Him even more and we're going to do even extra work. What we've already done before earned us this, we're going to even do double now to earn us even more. If this is what we got for that action, imagine what we can get for ten times that action. And so they did so. And many of them died for sabilillah. Compare the people of paradise and the others. In another narration, a Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned other companions that are not mentioned in this particular hadith, such as, as we mentioned before, Ukasha. Ukasha will enter paradise without accountability among the 70,000. So he's mentioned here. 
In another hadith, Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentions about a man, whom we don't know his name, who he said to his companions, a man will enter, and he is among the people of paradise. He entered and there was water dripping from his arms from wudu. And I think it was Abdullah ibn Abbas, he said, I wanted to follow him to see what actions he does so that I can be like him. The story is long, but he went and stayed at his house for three nights. On the third night, he asked him, what is it special about you? And the man thought, and finally he said, I think it's this. Every time I go to sleep, I do not leave a grudge in my heart to any Muslim brother or sister on the face of the earth. I resolve it in my heart. I forgive them. He said, ah, this is probably what you bid us with. So this is another man. Now here's something very interesting. Our Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentions certain qualities of these among the ten or among the twelve or the fifteen or how many, however many they are of their qualities. For example, Sa'ad radiallahu anhu among those whom he promised paradise. What, 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 why was this promise there? Let's look at one event. In the battle of Uhud, Sa'ad radiallahu anhu was specially chosen as one of the best archers together with Zayd and others. And Sa'ad was one of those who fought vigorously in defense of the Prophet sallallahu after some Muslims had deserted their positions in the battle of Uhud. And to urge him on, the Prophet sallallahu said to him, Idrib ya Sa'ad fidaka abi wa ummi. Shoot, O Sa'ad, may my mother and father, may I, may I be ransomed for you before my mother and father. Allahu Akbar. Ali radiallahu anhu says, that the Prophet he had never heard the Prophet ﷺ promising such a ransom to anyone except for Sa'ad. Sa'ad is also known as the first companion to have shot an arrow in the defense of Islam. Abu Ubaid ibn Jarrah, also another one. He was nicknamed the trustworthy man of this ummah. He was extremely loyal to this deen, never failed in any way. Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu. How many can we say about him? Remember the one we said last week? That he had a contract with this man of renting or hiring his horse? Remember that one? He was riding on his horse. And he, ha- and he was the Khalifa at that time. And then he forgot his blanket or a piece of material of his clothing back. So he climbed off his horse, walked back and got his clothing. Then the, the man who was with him, he said, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, I, I've got two questions for you. So what are your questions? He says, number one, why did you go walking on your feet to grab your cloak when you could have gone back on your horse and got it? First question. And question number two, why couldn't you ask me to just go get it for you? I would have gladly done so. The answers of Umar al-Khattab, he said, first of all, the contract between me and the hirer did not include that I used the horse to go back to grab my piece of clothing if I forgot it. So I'm sticking to the contract. He's honest, absolutely honest. And number two, he said, and you are not my servant. Just because I am Amir al Mu'mineen doesn't mean I need to abuse my responsibility. That now I get people working for my personal affairs. He said, You are not the servant of my personal affairs. For this, it's my personal. So he, he was trustworthy to his leadership. Or well, who do you want to talk about? Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. Once the Prophet ﷺ stood up in, the, in front of the people in the masjid of Medina and he said, Who of you today has woken up? Who of you today has started their day fasting? Abu Bakr radiallahu put his hand up. Then he asked another question. Who of you today have donated for sabilillah? Abu Bakr radiallahu put his hand up and a few others. But Abu Bakr again. Who of you today has attended a janazah? Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. A few other people, but not the same ones. But Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu was the same person. Who of you today, who of you today, he said, has so we said, fasted, donated, given in charity. Sorry, donated, fasted, attended a janazah, and there was one more. Now, visited a sick person for the sake of Allah today. He said, Ay ya Rasulallah. And he said, No person who these four meet together with him on one, in one day, this is on top of all the other good actions, except that he will be in paradise. Or he'll be asked to enter from any door that he wishes from paradise. And then he said to Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, wa arju annaka anta minhum. And I, I think that you, O oh Abu Bakr, are one of those who will enter on the day of judgment through any door you wish. Among the ones who were promised paradise, 
are four perfect women. I want to reserve the story of these four perfect women till next week, inshallah. Because I want to talk about them a little bit. There's so much to talk about the women of paradise as much as there is to talk about the men of paradise. But I end it with only one story of one of these women. She was actually called, and brace yourselves, she was actually called, not by name, not by lineage, no, no actually no one knows her name, and no one knows her, her lineage. And she was called the black woman. Now be careful. This word black woman is not a racial thing, nor is a nationalistic thing. It's actually the opposite. In a time where they saw black people inferior to everyone else, the hadith comes in and Ibn Abbas calls her the black woman, saying, you people who see black people inferior, look at what Islam has promised to this particular woman whom you call black, like that. So he's saying in a sarcastic way against those who defame and degrade people of colors. So narrated by Ata ibn Abi Rabah, ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu, who said to me, Shall I show you a woman of the people of paradise? I said, yes. He said, this black woman came to the Prophet ﷺ and said, I get attacks of epilepsy and my body becomes uncovered. Please invoke Allah for me to cure me. Then the Prophet ﷺ said to her, If you wish, only if you want, be patient and you will have paradise to enter. And if you wish, I will invoke Allah to cure you. Then she thought about it and said, I will remain patient, O Rasulullah. And she added, But I become uncovered. So please invoke Allah for me that I may not become uncovered. So the Prophet ﷺ invoked Allah for her to not become uncovered. This hadith is in Al-Bukhari. And here are my notes. Ibn Abbas, as we said, did not mean to point at the race, as we said, or to belittle her in any way. Indeed, he but meant to teach the people around him a great principle of Islam which is mentioned in the verse in the meaning of, O people, we have created you from a single pair of male and female made into nations and tribes. The most honored among you in Allah's eyes are the ones who are most pious. Secondly, the fact that the Prophet ﷺ said, if you wish, be patient and you will have paradise to enter is a proof of the virtue and reward of patience during sickness. In another hadith, the Prophet ﷺ says, whenever a hardship affects the Muslim, he will be forgiven for it even when he is pricked or picked by a spike in Sahih Muslim. And another hadith by Muslim that Umm As-Sa'ib cursed fever. She cursed fever. To which the Prophet ﷺ told her, do not curse fever, for it takes away the sins like the blaze of the fire that takes away the impurities of iron. The black woman preferred the suffering of this world to getting the eternal reward of paradise. She suffered from sickness, yet her pain and discomfort did not force her to forego pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And no matter who one is, brothers and sisters, if one is in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you will encounter difficulties. You will encounter difficulties. This is one of the pathways to paradise.